The last day of the Tour de France began with a 400 kilometers train journey to the town of saint genevieve des bois south of Paris. The last star town for Miguel Indurain before he takes his place in history as the first man to win five tours in a row. After three weeks, the 117 survivors are set now to ride into Paris, the city where the race has ended ever since inception in 1903. And we've made it too, as the Champs-Élysées now prepares to welcome the great Spanish champion, Miguel Indurain, the only rider to pull on the final Mayo Jaune since 1991. It's a perfect day here in the city to welcome the rider who has now truly become one of the great tour men. He began his fifth successive route to victory with less panache than normal when the torrential rain in saint briere caused him to reduce the risk and finish an uncharacteristic 35th. He was 31 seconds behind the day's winner in the prologue, Jackie Giron. For the next week, Indurain often stayed near the front of the race, but never attacked. He preferred to allow others to enjoy their tour. His, he said, began in the second week. However, he shocked the race when, on the eve of the first long time trial, he broke clear with the Belgian Johan Brunel. Although he lost the sprint in Liège, he had stolen a march and was now up to second overall and poised for the usual big lead after the time trial. That never happened when he won by only 12 seconds, but he did win, and he did get the yellow jersey. He was ahead of Bjorn Aris of Denmark by just 23 seconds as the race transferred to the Alps. Once there, his rivals attacked him. On the road to La Plagne, Alex Zula went off on a lone adventure. Indurain was forced to chase him alone two minutes behind. He finished second, and his lead was now almost two and a half minutes over Zula. Next day, Marco Pantani, the Italian climber, made his move, and again, Big Mick did most of the work behind to again finish second. His lead stayed at 2 minutes 27 seconds. The Alps had shown him to be stronger than most. He then kept away from trouble across the bottom of France, and then in the Pyrenees, he was ready once more to fend off the attacks from Pantani. On the road to Guzenege, the Italian went for a long one to gain time. So Indurain chased again, and this time he finished third on the stage. His lead was now 2 minutes 46 seconds over Zula, and with the stage to Poe neutralized by the tragedy, there was no further challenge to Indurain. He confirmed in the time trial around the lake of the Sivier that he was once more the best rider in a Tour de France, leaving just today's arrival on the Champs-Élysées to enjoy. He now becomes the first rider to win the Tour five times in a row. And Miguel Indurain at the start this morning, as always, the centre of attention, but today seemingly more popular than ever. The last route they face, 155 kilometres. If they stick to tradition, then they'll arrive on the Champs-Élysées all together. Then they face eight circuits of the Champs-Élysées. Just 115 riders have survived this very difficult tour, the smallest number, in fact, since Laurent Fignon won the race 12 years ago. And the riders who carry the leaders' jerseys, Miguel Indurain in yellow, of course, Laurent Jalabert, the green, and Richard Varenc is in the polka dot jersey as the winner of the King of the Mountains competition. But every rider to leave for Paris today thoroughly deserved congratulations. And they'll be happy too because the rain clouds of yesterday have disappeared. It's sunshine all the way to the Champs-Élysées with a high of 25 degrees Celsius this afternoon and a slight northeasterly wind of maximum 15 kilometers an hour. And there is the Eiffel Tower on the right shoulder now of the main field. All of the riders in this field are together today. There have been no particular pedals turned in anger, just a few small climbs in the Chevreuse Valley. And Miguel Indurain, in the last few minutes, has asked all of his team now to come to the front and to lead the Tour de France onto the Champs-Élysées. The riders are almost queuing up here to go underneath the bridge and uh, very shortly we're going to see them come on to the Place de la Concorde and then that they're going to turn on the style. I think when that moment comes you know the white flag of truce that has been out for most of this morning will come in and the speed will go up quite dramatically as everybody would like to get onto the Champs-Élysées in first place. When they hit the line they'll have eight laps of this circuit to do which is something like 50 kilometers in total. So a little chance to rejoin, and we're looking now at a man, uh, Rolf Aldag, who could certainly win the sprint. He's had a flat tyre, he's having to race back onto the pack. He, he's in a little bit of a hurry there, because he needs to get on now, because the race is about to begin. It's been a gentle potter in the beautiful French sunshine today, but it won't be any more now, as the riders race into the Champs-Élysées, and they line up then for the finish. In the distance, you can see the Arc de Triomphe. 
as the field now settle in for eight circuits. Jomi LeBlanc, the bottom right of our picture, the organizer. The telecom boys looking to see who is around in those pink jerseys. But it is the team who have nursed Miguel Indurain around 3,600 kilometers of France and Belgium, bringing him on to an enormous cheer. You see eight laps to go now, but the yellow jersey and all of his team from Modesto, the only complete team left in the race, have now brought this race onto the Champs-Élysées. So as the riders continue their circuits of the Champs-Élysées, let's join Gary Imlach, who has been on the tour for three weeks as well. He now takes us through some of the moments of the race. Britain had high hopes for a good start in saint -Brieuc, but the rain came down an hour into the prologue, and shortly afterwards, so did Chris Boardman. Well, one minute I was going at 80k an hour, and the next minute I wasn't. <laughs> I'm not so sure it was me pushing too hard, actually, that was my first thought. The more the change in surface, and with the dimming light, it was very difficult to see the uh, where it was totally smooth tarmac and where it was grippy. And when you're pushing it to the limit, that makes a big difference. Chris was out of the race with a broken ankle, and the Frenchman, Jackie Durand, was unexpectedly in yellow. Really, though, the first week belonged to the Italians, who won four straight stages, two of them Cipollini Sprint Specials. An Italian ended up in yellow, too. Fortunately for Ivan Gotti, no one seemed particularly interested. Fittingly, Eddie Merckx won the stage that took the tour into Belgium. Merckx the bike maker, that is. Telecom's Eric Zabel, celebrating his birthday, did the pedalling and the podium dancing. After the transfer down to the Alps, Richard Varenk was winning the King of the Mountains competition on points. But the people's choice was Marco Pantani. Without the burden of hair, Pantani passed the rest of the field on the way to passing the classic climber's test, Alp d'Huez. On the road to San Etienne, Britain's Max Chiandri and Colombia's Hernan Buena Hora shared the workload for 25 miles. When it came down to the last 100 metres, Max wanted to be alone. The next day, the French fans got their first Bastille Day winner in six years, as Laurent Jalabert extended his lead in the green jersey competition. By stage 13, Chiandri was the only Briton left in the race, as Sean Yates abandoned his final tour on the way to Ravel. Three days later, news of a crash involving one of Sean's teammates came over race radio. At first, seemingly no different from the dozens of other crashes that dot the race. But this one was. Fabio Casartelli lay still on the road with serious head injuries. On the way to hospital by helicopter, the Olympic champion survived three heart attacks, but doctors couldn't save him from his injuries. He was a super kid, I'll tell you. If, when you think about... Uh, somebody that was a, a champion and someone that was uh, had great character and someone that um, you were proud to be associated with. I think you, you were talking about Fabio Casertelli. The following day, the peloton paid its respects. The pack road to Poe was one 119-man team with the six remaining Motorola riders at the head. The first man across the line was Casartelli's roommate, Andrea Perron. Two days later, Lance Armstrong paid a personal tribute, with a stage win in Limoges, powered as much by emotional as physical strength. Yesterday, of course, the strongest man in the tour asserted himself in his speciality, just to underline the distance between the leader and the chasing bunch. The five men at the front are doing the most incredible ride to hold off this main field. Well, I'm absolutely amazed they're doing this, Paul, but this has been a ride and a half by these riders, and one's beginning to wish they don't get caught because they deserve the victory today. They really do. All the time they've shared the work, every one of them has gone to the front when necessary to push up the pace, to keep the pace as high as we've said, 45, 46, 47 kilometres an hour, and not one of them has shirked, not one of them has tried to be clever and sit at the back of the group, saving a little bit for the sprint. They've never had the chance to do that because of this. This is now Jimeno Diaz Zabala for Onse chasing. Wilfred Peters again is in the thick of it here. It's Onse and Mape now. Mape working for Johan Museo. Onse working well. Whoever can get it off the team. There's so many good ones, but the man they want to succeed wears a green jersey today, Laurent Jalabert. You can almost see the panic now as they realize time is running out for them. There's one and a half laps to go for these riders. The Mape boys are up there with the Onse riders. The clock actually going, I think, again in favor of the breakaways. They come past us here in the commentary position. I make it 24 seconds. So once again, those five riders at the front, they're stretching out that lead. 
Well, this is amazing. We don't often see riders hold off the big field on the Champs-Élysées, a field that wants to show itself off to be the very, very best, just as these cyclists are in their sport. But they've been outwitted so far today. Now they have a nasty habit of timing it to perfection. But they're letting time run out a little bit now. They're about seven kilometers from the finish of the Tour de France and the final stage, a stage which almost everybody feels they can win on the atmosphere which is coming from the Champs-Élysées. But those riders in the breakaway, Sergei Uchikov from Ukraine, Vanzella from Italy, Kasputis also from the Ukraine, Mejia and Serpolini, they are the riders in that break. Johan Bruneel, the Belgian who had the yellow jersey on his home country in Belgium just two weeks ago today, comes to the front, putting the pressure on for his man, Laurent Jalabert. But, you know, I think they may well have left it just a little bit too late. 23 seconds is the official time gap at the moment. They just cannot make any inroad at all into the lead that these five riders have had for six laps now. Almost since the moment we joined the circuit here, there was an attack. And it was Serpolini, I think, who put in the first attack. Quickly joined by the others, they went clear. And now, as they're coming round to the final circuit of the Champs-Élysées, they are still clear, and really by about the same as when they were on the first lap, because it's never really altered very much. It has never altered very much more than 10 seconds. The maximum lead they had was 35 seconds, and since then it's hovered all around the 22 to 25 second mark. It really has been an incredible chase, but it may well be the sprinters judge it to perfection, because this last six-kilometer lap of the Champs-Élysées could bring it all back together, especially if somebody in that leading group of five starts to play the tactical game and starts to miss the moves. Novell helping out as well now because they've hidden rather a lot, but really they've got to come up here and help the other teams. They've got the sprinter in Abdu Japarov. Now they're helping out the Mape team and the Onse team. Three teams with three sprinters on it. And they're beginning to think that, heck, it's not going to work out. We aren't going to get our men up here. Five men at the front, Sergei Uchikov. He's already got one stage victory in the bag. It's his in Ravel when he outsprinted Lance Armstrong after a 125 mile breakaway, which is an incredible performance in such awful heat. Today it's slightly different. He's only been at the head of the fairs for 50 kilometers, but he's a clever rider. He'll be relaxed. He knows he's had a stage victory already, and he's also an extremely good track sprinter. And what a ride by Marco Serpolini, the youngest man in the race, is in second position now. And he might well begin to dream of winning the last stage in Paris. There's the main field, the green jersey of Laurent Jalabert. You can see him about eight men down from the front, hoping his team can now do what's beginning to look a little bit doubtful. And that's pull back those five front runners. Now, when they come into the home straight, they're going to get one lap to go to end the Tour de France. Here they are. The bell is ringing. One lap to go. The final lap of the Champs-Élysées. The Tour de France will come to an end in six and a half kilometres time. And these men who broke away on the first lap of the Champs-Élysées are still clear by almost the same gap. It's unbelievable. They're going to come by us in a fraction of a second. We'll get a chance for an unofficial time check. I make it 20 seconds on the line here, but in six kilometers time, Miguel Indurain is going to ride himself into history because he will take his fifth consecutive victory in the Tour de France. But who is going to get the stage? Will it be one of the five men in the front or will they come back? It's beginning to look like it might. Eros Poli is launching an attack off the front. The speed of the main field. I cannot believe these five riders are surviving. They are doing a tremendous ride. It's still 20 seconds. Eros Poli now tries to get some more life out of this race. And again, it's Onse dragging the men back into the action. Eros Poli pretending he's got Mario Cipollini at his wheel. He said, the only thing I live for is exploding in the final few kilometers of a race to bring Mario Cipollini into the ideal position for the bunch sprint. Today, Cipollini is not there, but this man in the green jersey is Laurent Jalabert. If his team could just pull out a little bit more, they may well get the stage victory they want for him today. But even Alex Zula lying second overall in this race is now working at the front. He's forgetting his second place. He's trying to get this race back together so Jalabert will get the stage win. They are throwing everything. There is Jalabert himself now, realizing that his big dream could be disappearing. Jalabert would love to take the stage victory here, but in his wheel there is the man from Mape, Johan Muzer. He knows a good wheel to watch when it comes to a final sprint. And now the tactical part of this race, the five riders in the front starting to look at each other, starting to think, how can I win this race? We've been working together for five laps, for six laps. We've been friends. Now we have to become enemies. We have to decide how we're going to win this race. 
And as we go under the shadow of the Arc de Triomphe for the last time, the five leaders, Uchikov, Vanzella, Kasputis, Mekir, Serpolini, are just hanging on to the race lead. They've done it so well so far. And I think, you know, they might not have their day spoiled yet. Miguel Indurain is just keeping out of trouble in this big field. He's watching the final drama unfold as we watch an attack now by Laurent Brochard. Brochard tries every time that he can to get away, but this is not the way to bring back the whole breakaway. You know, you have to work together. You need four or five men to try and chase down. At the front, as Brochard looks under his shoulder, he knows that those five riders are starting to work together. But if they pause for just a fraction of a second, he may well get across. So Brochard has had a very, very good Tour de France this year on the same team as Richard Verenck, who is now going to be crowned very shortly as the King of the Mountains on this year's event, as he was a year ago. That's the view the riders have of this breakaway. This is the view we have of the breakaway. And they are still there, Paul. They are holding on. They're holding on by the skin of their teeth at the moment. Brochard trying to get across as a Novel rider too. That may well be Yatislav Ekimov, the Russian rider, trying to bridge across. But behind, the main field still accelerates. They're still trying to chase them down. I think they may well have left it too late unless the riders in the front start to slow down and watch each other before we come into the final kilometers. This has been an outstanding ride by that breakaway. Vyatislav Yekimov comes up now with the Novel. They're realizing that their sprinter, Abdu Japarov, may not need to go in anger today unless they bring these five back. And that's an awful thing about this breakaway today. They have never been out of sight of the main field. They've always hovered in this big, long straightaway. It's two kilometers to the top, and it's two kilometers all the way down, and they've always been in sight of the main field. It's been like a carrot in front of a donkey, but they haven't been able to pull it back, Phil. This time, it's down to 12 seconds. 12 seconds, and we're in the last half lap, and Steve Bowder wants the television motorbike away because the peloton are in its slipstream, and that's why we've gone. Steve Bauer rightly so waved away the television there because the rider setting the pace in the back slipstream was Andrea Tappi of Mappe, who wants their sprinter, Johan Museo, up for the finish. And again, it's a rider from Novell that may well have been Eric Decker trying to go through there. Steve Bauer moves up to his wheel because he wants to do the work of the teammate. He doesn't want those five men in the front to be caught. He has a man there, Alvaro Mejia. He swings off to try and slow down the main field as they come down off the Place de la Concorde round the back of the Garden of the Tuileries. And it's not very far to go, about two and a half kilometers for these leading group of five riders. And Phil, it's going to go right down to the line. This is what I expected oh. to happen. They're starting to look at each other. Nine seconds is the gap now. It's going to be very close. Somebody had to go that it stopped there that have been eaten in about 200 meters but they've gone now and this time it looks to me as though Sergei Uchikov is the man who has attacked Alvaro Mejia tried to get across but this is not his kind of race it's not the kind of situation he likes to be in he's a man for the mountains Vanzella knows that he's gone straight over the top to pull back Uchikov this is going to be an incredible finish to this final stage of the Tour de France Vanzella is now on the wheel of Sergei Uchikov the five riders have come back together if they start this kind of maneuvering you know it's going to come all together in the last 200 meters and we're going to have a tremendous sprint one and a half kilometers to go to the finish now as the Mappe team still try to drag this main field back into the action Uchikov has done one attack they've marked him the five men have rejoined together into the tunnel for the last time then we'll see the breakaway here they are coming out of the Merck now as Uchikov goes again and Serpolini trying to grab him followed by Kasputis Mekir Sandy that's the order now as they go Vanzella is last in the line but this bunch is screaming across the Place de la Concorde. The gap now down to about five or six seconds. They can see the remainder of the group in front of them. Uchikov has gone. In fact, it's Serpolini who knows what the danger is. He's chasing him down at the moment in the lime green and the pink jersey of Lamprey. The five riders at the front, as soon as they catch Uchikov, it's going to come back together. But will the main field have enough left just to claw oh. back to these five riders? We've never had a finish like this in the Tour de France before. This has been a superb race. The sprinters are trying to get back in there on the rapids now they're just holding it off here but i think you know they're sitting up for some reason as vanzella's looking across they're really making a big mistake they'll let them back in they do this and Alvaro Mejia has decided now is the time to go. He hasn't got a chance at all if it comes down to the sprint. He's decided to give it everything he's got over these last few hundred meters. They're chasing him down. Have the sprinters timed it to perfection, or are they going to lose it in the last few hundred meters? Across the Place de la Concorde, then at about 400 meters from the line now. But look at the speed of the pack. They are coming so quickly here now as the escapers go under our camera. Then the pack comes under, looking to lead out Giovanni Lombardi. He's the rider in second place now. They're coming right on as Lombardi takes a dive across 
across the gap to Vekir looks over his shoulder. Don't do that because the Pulte boys are coming. Jalabert on the far right. This is going to be an incredible finish. Giovanni Lombardi tries to get his first stage win in the Tour de France. Abdu Jabarov is coming on the right along with Laura Jalabert. Abdu Jabarov gets it. Can you believe that? And what an end to the Tour de France as further down the field. The man that we all salute is Miguel Ingerain, a great, great man who has won the Tour de France for a record five years now. He sat at the back, in fact, he's tapping the shoulders there of Gerard Rouet, his faithful workhorse. This has been a superb end to the Tour de France. Ingerain is the winner, and Jamaluddin Abdu Jafarov has proved to us all that man is still one of the best finishers in the world. There's a scene on the Champs-Élysées now where we've seen some marvellous stages of this race over the years. I often say seeing the spinners at work is the best, but they almost misjudged that, Paul. Well, I think that was the closest they would like to come. That was very close. You know, it was all down to the last few hundred metres. It looked very much as if they were going to stay away. Those five riders escaped on the first of the eight laps. But look at this. As they came back, there is the Palti riders leading it out for Giovanni Lombardi just behind. But he's a little bit too far off the wheel, coming out from almost nowhere. On the bottom of the screen there, you can see Laurent Jalabert in the green jersey. But this time, Jamaluddin Abdujaparov on the left-hand side has decided he's not going to make any mistakes. He opens the gap. He's got all of the road to himself he's going to get what to him will be an extremely sweet victory because he's had only one victory so far this year and this one there's no discussing as he comes across the line he takes it quite easily ahead of somebody from the lap mercatoni squad what a superb victory by abdu jaffa there he is in the white he dives into open space this time this man has got happy and sad memories of the chance he say he crashed here heavily a couple of years ago now he's won second time here, a victory on the Champs-Élysées. This will be the sweetest moment for him, and what a great finish indeed. Just look at his face here, how much further to go he keeps saying, and then he says, that'll do me. Terrific win by the man they call the Tashkent Terror, and this time, there was no doubt either, a photo not required. This was a fitting finale to this great race. It was probably the best sprint we have seen throughout the three weeks of racing. The man we thought was beginning to lose his speed. Well, today he refound it and produced an inch perfect finish. So what a marvelous sprint that was. Abdu Jafarov finally snatching the result here in Paris. He was finishing ahead of Fagnini, Giovanni Lombardi, Laurent Jalabert got four for Anse. Britain's Max Chiandri was fifth, and the German Eric Zabel took sixth. So on the podium tonight, Jamaluddin Abdu Jafarov had the last laugh among the sprinters. Overall, there was no change at all today. Miguel Ingerain, the winner of the Tour de France for a fifth straight time, and that is a record. He now joins as five times a winner, Jacques Anquetil, Eddie Merckx, and Bernard Eno. And on the podium tonight, he looked as composed as ever as he stood alongside Alex Zula and Bjarne Ries, both newcomers to the top three finish in this Tour de France. So I hope you've enjoyed this coverage of the final stage of the Tour de France here on a beautiful day in Paris. On behalf of Paul Sherwin and Gary Imlach, I'm Phil Liggett saying goodbye.